Yes. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending upon where you're watching from. Great to have you here. I am Janice Kamenu Resnick, and on behalf of our leadership team, Zavir Oslovsky, former Congressman Mel Levine, Rabbi Ken Chase and Caroline Kelly and myself, I am pleased to welcome you to tonight's program, our second program this week. A special welcome and thank you to today's guest, Heather Cox Richardson, whom I've been looking forward to meeting and hearing tonight. Each night for the last couple of years, the last thing I do before I go to sleep is to read Professor Richardson's daily post, Letters from an American on Substack. I have consistently found her writing and her work to be enlightening, instructive, and even inspiring. So thank you for your prolific writing and excellent teaching and for sharing yourself with us tonight. And also, of course, welcome and thank you to our outstanding moderator, the gifted journalist, Pat Morrison. Next Wednesday, January 17th, we will be treated to an hour with UC Berkeley Law School Dean and foremost constitutional uh, scholar, Erwin Shemarinsky. Dean Shemarinsky will be speaking about anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism on college campuses, what can be done. Dean Shemarinsky, aside from his brilliance as a constitutional law scholar, has been uh, at ground zero of these issues that have roiled college campuses around the country and is uniquely positioned to discuss them. The following week on Wednesday, January 23rd, we will have as our guest Damon Linker, political analyst, author, and contributing editor at The New Republic in conversation with Warren Olney with the topic 2024, Another Year in Defiance of Political Reality. That's a question. For those still having problems with our new streamlined registration system, I strongly recommend that you remove the Zoom app from your device and reinstall it. Those that have used that approach have informed me that it has helped to solve their problem. Also remember the Zoom link comes directly from Zoom, not from us. Please look in your spam. Uh, for the email from Zoom. Zoom sends three emails, one when you register, one 24 hours before the program begins, and one one hour before the program begins. All three contain the join webinar link. And a special little hint uh, is that if you can't find it, find one of our emails and re-register for the program within the 30 minutes before it starts, and you will automatically get a big join webinar uh, link in that confirmation email, and you can go straight to the program. Uh, so I hope it's easier. I hope that you find it and are not frustrated. And of course, we're here to help you when all else fails. And now please welcome the amazing Pat Morrison, award-winning broadcast and newspaper journalist, LA Times columnist, author, and overall superstar. Just this week, Pat's column entitled Anti-Semitism Has a Long History in Los Angeles chronicles more than 100 years of anti-Semitism in Los Angeles with her usual excellence and depth. Pat, thank you for your lifetime of work and for sharing your great skills with our audience. Thank Pat. You. Janice, thank you for those nice words. Thanks to the audience. And thanks, of course, to everybody who supports the vital programs that we put on here. Um, Heather Cox Richardson, you know, is a professor of history at Boston College. Her new book is Democracy Awakening. We'll be talking about that, taking your questions later in the hour for her. Uh, as you heard, Janice mentioned her Substack Letters from an America, her daily newsletter. On her Twitter profile, she calls herself a budding curmudgeon. So we'll see how we can grade her on that. She says, I study the contrast between image and reality in America, especially in politics, a gap that seems to be growing wider and wider as the years go by. Thank you so much for being here. We're all very grateful. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here and to get a chance to talk with you uh, about the stuff that's happening in the world today. But you know, you've got quite a, quite a uh, body of work yourself. Well, thank you for that. 40 minutes, 60 minutes isn't enough, but I'm sure that we'll have you back to pick up where we, wherever we have to leave off for tonight. Uh, the, the naturalist Aldo Leopold, this is a, a big picture question. He, he likened the health of the natural world to an airplane in flight, that if you lose a species, it's like losing a rivet, and you can lose two species or five, two rivets or five, but at one point you're going to reach the species or the rivet that pops and the plane goes down. I think that's a good analogy for democracy as a plane in flight, and I'm wondering if you have any idea how many rivets we have left. Well, the only thing I would say about democracy versus the natural world is that we can rebuild rivets for democracy, and we can't get back the, the, the species that we lose in the natural world and the destruction of an ecosystem. Politics is about people, and governments are about people, and we can always rebuild. So how many have we lost? 
a lot. And I think we're going to find in 2024 if we have lost enough that the plane goes down. But as I say, unlike the natural world, we can rebuild the ones that seem to be weakening at least or seem to have popped out between now and then. And certainly if in fact we manage to preserve democracy in 2024, we can really rebuild the plane after that. Uh, the anniversary of the January 6th assault on the Capitol uh, has just passed, and we've spent a lot of time discussing it and hearing about it uh, and reading about it. Uh, do you think that that anything about what happened that day has changed in the minds of Americans, the perceptions of it? Obviously, we hear January 6th defendants saying, oh, Donald Trump duped me. He fooled me into all of this. But, but do people still think today the way they thought on January 6th? Um, did it change anything? Well, I think it changed a number of things. I think in the, in the macro sense, it was a really big deal that the Confederate battle flag hung or was walked through the US Capitol. That was a, a, a major statement in terms of American history. And I'd be happy to talk more about that. But I think what has really changed and what January 6th really changed is, first of all, it, it stopped our system of peaceful transfer of power. It also came us, brought us very close to having a, an authoritarian coup and losing democracy altogether. But it also cemented the Republican Party behind the idea of an authoritarian leader. And it's really instructive that nowadays, if you think about it, former President Donald Trump really is running a presidential campaign on January 6th. He's really trying to say the big lie was real. This is all about taking back the United States. And he's really made it, he's not walking away from it. He's embracing it. And in all the cases about uh, January 6th, he's not saying he didn't do these things. He's saying he was justified in doing these things. So what that did on the one hand was to destroy the Republican party. It managed to turn a lot of Americans into people who supported authoritarians. But I think on the side of other Americans who don't agree to becoming a, a, an authoritarian country run by MAGA Republicans, what January 6th did is it helped to underscore just how fragile democracy is. So one of the things that political scientists will tell you is that whenever we have a trial, for example, or a hearing on January 6th as the House Committee on the January 6th uh, uh, attack on the US Capitol uh, showed when they did their hearing about what had happened there was that when Americans saw once again what those rioters really did to, uh, to the officers in the Capitol and what they did to the Capitol, their enthusiasm for MAGA Republicans plummets. The numbers really drop. So there is, I think, a sense of the, the MAGA Republicans that they are now full on authoritarian uh, supporters. There's a part, a, a, a piece in which the rest of us say we are really not about that. Um, and there is uh, a sense, I think, that, that we need to, um, to recognize how important it is to, um, to prosecute the people who were involved in January 6th, because one of the things that makes January 6th different, for example, than the Confederate attack on the United States is that after the Confederacy, nobody went to jail. There was no penalty paid for a, a war that, that had 600,000 casualties and cost more than $6 billion. The fact that more than 1,000 people have been charged with crimes related to the attack on the US Capitol, and I believe the number is somewhere in the 900s of people who have been convicted, many of whom have gone to prison, I think that tends to re enforce the idea of the rule of law and makes it less likely that people are going to be willing to do that again. So is it going to be a blip in American history? You know, it's funny, I wrote a history of the Republican Party, and I thought I would have an entire chapter on Watergate, because I thought Watergate was the most important thing ever. And when I actually put together a much larger picture, I was like, well, Watergate was part of a longer story. It doesn't get its own chapter, it gets a piece of one chapter. January 6th is always going to have its own chapter. Oh. We have seen since then, since the elections of 2022, the midterm elections, that as the Republican Party, as the Trump Party becomes more rigid and digs in its heels state by state, legislat legislatures passing laws that their own Republican majorities in some red states oppose, for example, with abortion, trying to restrict voting rights. Um, this gap then it seems between the wishes of people even in some red states and what the Republican Party is doing to consolidate its hold on its authority 
seems to be something that goes to what you were talking about, that more people are saying, maybe this isn't the right way to go. They haven't changed party allegiances, but they're looking perhaps more skeptically at what their party is doing in their name. Well, I think one of the things that's really important to remember is the current cabal in charge of the Republican Party is not a traditional Republican Party. As I always like to say, it's not your mother's Republican Party. They are a, an extremist minority that has taken over the party and has tried to take over the American government. And so they, in fact, are not representing the American people. And things like gun safety legislation is a great example of that. You know, the, the number of people in the United States who want common sense gun safety legislation is more than 70 percent. I mean, you can't get 70 percent of people to agree on, you know, when to hold Thanksgiving dinner, right? So the fact that there, there are that many people who want it and this small group of extremists saying, no, 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 we're not gonna do that, indicates both that the current day Republican party does not represent either the original party or the American people. It also suggests that we have a real problem with an anti-majoritarian uh, current running through American America right now in which our system has been perverted in such a way that it has permitted this very small group of people to take over our system. And again, most political scientists will tell you that a reactionary right-wing movement never gets more than about 30% of true believers. But what it does get is it gets true believers who get into central places of power and it cows everybody else into going along with them. So they, they're, they're kind of dragged along behind this very small minority. So one of the things that I worry about in 2024 is the degree to which during the former President Trump's administration, his people worked to cement power in the state legislatures, in the state Republican parties. And you can see that, for example, right now in Michigan, where there's been a big fight over the party there, and in um, Florida, where, of course, there's been this big scandal over the Republican Party in Florida, and in, uh, in some of the other Republican states, where Trump uh, people in place in those states have run their parties out of money, have, have created real problems within the party, but they have managed to retain control over state legislatures. And one of the reasons that this worries me, of course, is because of the gerrymandering that they have put in place in such a way that they're managing to take, for example, a state that's divided pretty much 50-50 like North Carolina and give it an extraordinarily heavily, uh, heavily Republican state legislature and also congressional delegation. Here's what worries me. What worries me is that going into 2024, I think it's pretty clear that the way you look at, at Trump running his campaign, he's running on extremism, he's running on language that, that echoes authoritarians and people who have committed genocide, he is threatening to destroy American democracy, he's making this very clear with things like the Project 2025, which is designed for him, or a Trump-like figure, it's important to remember this is now not just about him, there are all sorts of things that he is threatening to do that are not appealing to, uh, to, to a middle or to undecided voters. He clearly is making no attempt at all to expand his reach. So what does that mean? What is he hoping to do? And one of the things that has me extremely concerned these days is the 12th Amendment to the Constitution. And the 12th Amendment to the Constitution says that if nobody gets a majority in the Electoral College, the decision goes to the House of Representatives. And in the House of Representatives, each state delegation gets a single vote. Well, in the 2024 election, because they're the people who are going to be certifying the results of 2024, uh, the presidential results of 2024, if there is a majority Republican uh state delegations in, in the House of Representatives, and that decision gets thrown into the House of Representatives, the 12th Amendment would enable those extremist state delegations to put Trump in power, even if he loses the vast majority of us. And, and that's, that could be done constitutionally. And that is exactly what the original plan from um, John Eastman for 2020 said. Hey, listen, we'll get Pence to throw all this stuff out. And when the, 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 Democrats howl, he'll say, okay, we don't have a majority and we'll throw it into the House of Representatives. We got more Republican states in the House than we do Democratic states. Trump will be president. So it's not like they haven't thought this one through ahead of time. And as I'm watching what's happening in the states and the extraordinary gerrymandering in many of the states that is, um, you know, really even state Supreme Courts in some cases have said that the gerrymanders, they're illegal. I, I worry that there's a larger, there's a larger plan behind that. So as I think you pointed out in the book, at least half of the presidential elections in this century, the winning candidate has not won the 
majority of the popular vote. So what you're describing is a Trump machine, a Republican machine that's relying not on getting more votes, but on altering or controlling the mechanics that's of correct. an election that is not dependent on the winner of the popular vote. That's as exactly well, as well as the judiciary. Far better than I did. Yeah, you put it far better than I did. That's exactly what I'm worried about because it would be possible if you just muddied the waters enough uh, to say, oh, we don't really know what happened in this state. You know, we don't really know what happened here to throw it into the House of Representatives. And that, um, and, you know, we can walk through how one could do that. But what I'm suggesting is that this is something to be prepared for before 2024 and to make sure that those numbers are big enough that they are not challengeable. And the reason I say that is I don't, I don't think it's about Republicans versus Democrats any longer. It is quite literally about preserving democracy or losing to an authoritarian, losing our democracy to an authoritarian. And, um, and you know, he's not making any secret about what he's going to do. And, and this is it, that the, the signs are all there. The, you can follow the breadcrumbs or however you'd like to characterize it. But so much of what he did the first time in the White House is prologue. The past is prologue to what this plan would be more effectively carried out, um, more determinedly. Now they know what levers to push. And so you have things that didn't get accomplished the first time, like he wanted to reclassify 50,000, as you write in your book, 50,000 federal employees from civil servants to political appointees so he could fill 50,000 jobs with his own people, that he tried to dismantle elements of the Department of Agriculture by telling the staff they had to move to the middle of the country if they wanted to keep their jobs. So that was an imperfect delivery of these ideas. Now you're saying that he has them perfected and he's telling people that this is what he's going to do. And yet people don't seem to be paying attention or at least thinking of the consequences. Well, I, a couple of caveats there. I actually don't think he's the mind behind this because it's a pretty complicated uh, scheme now. And and it takes a lot to pull off a scheme like that. I think he is interested in keeping himself out of prison. And he's always been about Donald Trump. And that's what he really cares about. He wants to have power. He wants to have money. He doesn't want to go to prison. But there are a number of people who recognize that he is a vehicle for overturning American democracy. And the reason for that and the argument behind that, and this is quite clear, you know, it's not really breadcrumbs. They talk about it all the time. Um, the, is, is the idea that democracy protects the idea that everybody should be treated equally before the law. And the problem with that for a number of reactionary people on the right is that that means that women should be treated equally. And I don't think we're paying enough attention to how important misogyny is to this equation, but that women should be treated equally and they should have equal rights. And so you, you're, I, I can talk what how they're talking about breaking that down, but, but uh, people of color, black Americans, um, and LGBTQ plus people should all be treated equally before the law. And what they are saying, what people like Viktor Orban of Hungary are saying, or Vladimir Putin of Russia is saying, is that democracy, therefore, is um, is itself corrupt at its heart. And, and you know, and, and and it also permits immigration, which they insist poisons the blood of a nation, right? Which is again language that comes straight. We, have, we heard that before, yes. Right, exactly. So the idea is you need to stop the idea that 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 everybody has an equal right to be treated equally before the law. You need to get rid of that because what that means is that women and black Americans and LGBTQ plus people have the same right to protection before the law as white men do, white heteronormative men do. And that's a really attractive argument for people who are exceptionally religious or who are um, racist or who are misogynistic or who, you know, keep having this, having this fantasy about the 1950s and thinking we can go back to what they see anyway as a wonderful moment. So they are literally trying to get rid of liberal democracy. Now, there's a really interesting thing in that, though, and that's that one of the things that people like Ron DeSantis has done in Florida, he's the governor of Florida, is that he has come down on the cruise ships and 
on Disney trying to say, well, you can't back LGBTQ plus uh, equality because I, I'm gonna, I, I want, I don't want you to do that. I think that's destroying, uh, you know, religion and and all the good stuff that we, I think, our state should be about. So I'm gonna force you to do that. I'm gonna use the power of the state to make you do what I want you to do. Now that's a real problem for people who have backed Republicans in the past because they like the idea of getting rid of regulation and they like the idea of getting rid of taxes because basically they're looking at more of a small libertarian type state. And here you've got Governor DeSantis saying, no, 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 we're gonna have a strong state and it's gonna force you to behave according to my moral code. Well, that's not something that's very attractive to a, to a businessman who basically wanted the state to get out of his way. So you're seeing a number of them jump ship to try and support Nikki Haley instead of this other organization. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this attack on democracy, but it is very real. And the idea of, uh, of getting rid of that democracy is to put in place a theocracy or Christian nationalism in which the majority of Americans will answer to the moral code of whomever is in power. And the thing that is quite interesting about, there's a number of things that are quite interesting about that, but you know, doctrinally, what does that mean? Like who gets to call which flavor of Christianity is in charge? And this is of course exactly taking us back to where the, the founders of this country and the framers of the constitution were in which they said, listen, we might be believers or we might not be believers, but what we are believers in is the idea that once we start trying to base a, demo, a, base a government on religion, it's only a question of time until there's blood in the streets. As you said, Trump isn't making any secret of this. And the other day he used the words, our religion, you know, people who share our religion. He was speaking of immigrants, but he could just as easily have been talking about people who are here, who are American citizens. Yes, that's exactly right. And, and again, th that was such an interesting thing because what is our religion? Now I'll tell you in the 19th century, there was an attempt, uh, and I'm gonna be writing about this soon. There was an attempt to put an amendment into the constitution, making this a Christian nation. And they're really, really powerful speeches from Congress people, congressmen in that era in the late 19th century saying, no, no, we are not a Christian nation. We have Muslims, we have Jews, we have, you know, you can be anything you want to be in this country and we are not going to make this a Christian nation. And that, um, that idea that we would be overturning that now and saying, oh yeah, we're, we're a Christian nation, what does that mean? Like whose, whose religion is our religion? There have been Muslims on this continent, one of the first people to come into, um, into the, what is now the United States of America, who was, was not an indigenous American, was a Muslim. So, you know, wh where are we gonna start drawing the lines about what our religion is? One chapter you write about something called positive polarization, and we've we've seen gradually ideas of the big sword and how Americans decide who they are, not just because of how they feel about themselves, but because of all the input, the pressure, um, the strategizing that goes on around them to make them decide who are you with, what team are you on, what is then positive polarization, and how has it gotten us to where we are? So this is a really interesting concept. If you think about um, the United States coming out of World War II, we had what was called at the time and is thought of in history as the liberal consensus. And what that means, and a number of people nowadays equate liberalism with Democrats. And in fact, that was a deliberate attempt to make it sound like it was something that Republicans should turn against because the original concept of the liberal consensus was that Americans, both Democrats and Republicans, think Eisenhower here, believed that government had a role to play in four major areas. It should regulate business, it should provide a basic social safety net, it should promote infrastructure, and it should protect civil rights. And that really actually comes to fruition under Eisenhower more than it does under the Democrats because of their, their racist base in, until the 18, 1960s. So Republicans and Democrats both believe in this liberal consensus. And one of the things that that really highlights this is this is where we get the idea of Foghorn Leghorn. Foghorn Leghorn, the, the cartoon character is actually based on a radio character, Senator Claghorn. And he was this reactionary Southern racist Democrat at the time who was always complaining about the liberal consensus. That's not what he calls it. But for example, he comes to New York and he refuses to drive through the Lincoln Tunnel for, you know, because he's so determined not to be part of this larger consensus. But what happens is that 
Um, the, those people who want to get rid of that liberal consensus want to get rid of that government. And in, in the early days, they are primarily businessmen who want to get rid of business regulation. They are not that concerned yet about taxes because they want to pay down the national debt that has gone so high during World War II. So it, they, they begin to push against this liberal consensus. And they really don't get any traction until after um, the Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954, in which all of a sudden they can sit there and turn to the Southern racists and say, hey, we told you this government that you liked so much was going to give Black people rights. We told you this was going to happen. And that's where you start to see a coming together of the business wing of the, the Republican Party and the racist wing of the Democratic Party, which are going to marry each other in the 1960s. But so... Um, <clears throat> What happens is that in 19, I'm jumping ahead here, in 1960, the, the, the parties switch sides and, and they really flip in the, in the middle of the 1960s after the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And by 1968, you've got Nixon. Nixon's a fascinating character because Nixon was Eisenhower's vice president, but he is also trying to court these, uh, these, these radicals, essentially. They're called movement conservatives at the time into the Republican Party. The Southern strategy. They're the racists. And so he's kind of in 69 and into 70 trying to pull back and forth between these two pieces. And then Vietnam and then Kent State happens in May of 1970. And when that happens, he loses his middle class sort of white male base uh, because they really handled that incredibly badly. And when they do that, they recognize, especially his uh, his uh, advisor, Pat Buchanan, recognizes that, that Nixon's in real trouble going into 1972. And so they come up with this idea of positive polarization. And what that means to them is it's positive because it will get people to vote for Republicans and it will do so by polarizing the country. That is by saying, you know, we're the people who are law and order. We're the people who believe in hard work. We're the people who believe in going to church. And those people, and in the, in the Nixon administration, they didn't really articulate who those people were, although they certainly implied they were the indigenous Americans who- The voters filled it in for themselves. That's correct. Uh, but women are, are involved in this. And this is before Brown versus, uh, this is before Roe versus Wade, for example, which is in 73. This is as early as 71. They're talking about women who are burning their bras and things like that. And they, they develop this idea of us versus them. And it works. Obviously, it works. 72, Nixon, it just, it's just a total romp. He gets every uh, every state except Massachusetts and Washington, D.C. So that idea that you can get together a coalition that will support the Republicans, even though their destruction of government is not popular on an individual issue basis, really takes off in the Republican Party. And then, of course, by the time you get to Ronald Reagan, who is going to be the next um, the next person to, to employ this, uh, in in uh, in 1980, he's really kind of put it on steroids. You know, it's it's the welfare queen implied to be a black woman from the south side of Chicago who's taking right. advantage of this government that is, you know, and on and on and on. And that idea of polarizing the country to keep people people voting for Republicans takes off under Reagan. And then by eight, 1986, they recognize that even still, people don't like this program. And so by 1986, we start to see the real import of evangelicals into the Republican Party and the right. beginning of voter suppression. That's when voter suppression starts as well. It's been a long time coming, but some of the perfection of it uh, has been reached recently. There, there are a lot of questions. There's there's one that jumps right into it, and I think people are very concerned about this. And to, the, the, to paraphrase a number of audience questions, whether you think, and this is reading history from the 1850s too, do you think this next election could actually lead to a hot civil war? As, as we hear alarms and threats coming even now? So that's a somewhat complicated question in that you kind of have to define what a civil war is. Yes, I would argue- I don't think it would be geographic the way it was 170 you know, years ago. We're, we're not that country geographically anymore. No, but we already are in an extraordinarily violent time in terms of, of gun safety in this country. So there's already shootings going on. Domestic violence is a big problem. There's a lot of violence that will show up in the history books that we are so accustomed to. We're not really calling it out. So that's one, one thing that you talk about civil war that gets a little complicated. We're certainly not going to be able to divide geographically, but I would argue that we already are in an, a civil war 
that is being fought psychologically. It's being fought by the media. It's being fought by this, this conflict between image and reality, what is really happening versus the image of what is happening. And so in many ways, you could say we are already are in that major splitting of the country in which we are fighting for control of the people who are trying to either destroy democracy or protect it. But for people who are concerned about a hot war, there's always a point I'd like to make. And that is that the American Civil War happened because it happened so quickly. And anybody who wants you to do something quickly does not have your best interests at heart ever. So, you know, if you get an, an a, a, a email saying you must do this immediately, close it for two days because that's somebody trying to get you to do something else that, that you really, upon reflection, wouldn't do. So if you think about the American Civil War, what happens is that when Lincoln is elected, South Carolina is the only state in the union that still has its legislature choose its electoral votes. And so that, that legislature is sitting in November of 1860. And when they hear that Lincoln is elected, they instantly decide to take the state out of the union. And then remember, we're going to Christmas season and that means balls and that means liquor and that means dancing and that means impressing the girls, right? So the, the Southerners, the Southern elite class really whips itself up into a frenzy and says, we're going to start our own country, we're going to do this. And then nothing happens. You know, Lincoln takes office in March that year that they're not going to switch inaugurations into January, into January until FDR. So he takes office in March and still nothing happens and it's starting to be planting season and, and people are starting to think, well, maybe I drank a little much over Christmas and maybe we don't really want our own country. And that's when the Confederate leaders and the, the leaders of, the, of South Carolina recognize that unless they do something, it's all going to fall apart. So one of the things about the, the Trump administration was that if you remember the, the Muslim ban that became popularly known as the travel ban actually happened in January of 2017, almost immediately. They hit the ground running with that and it was chaos, if you remember. You know, the, the airports were in chaos, people were running around, some people were suddenly trying, you know, being deported and there were lawyer, immigration lawyers showing up at airports. And, and I think that was an attempt to throw things into chaos really quickly and convince people in the United States that we did need a stronger leader. And really at that point, especially women stepped up and took everything to the courts and slowed everything down. And the other moment that could have happened really quickly was January 6th. That, that day, not only was the vice president in the Capitol building, so was the... Um, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, third in line for the, the presidency, and uh, Senate pro tem President uh, Chuck Grassley from Ohio. So if in fact the rioters had managed to get their hand, I mean, it's almost never that you have those many people in succession in the same place. If the rioters had managed to get their hands on any one of them, God forbid, or more of them, and Trump had called out uh, the troops under the Insurrection Act, which clearly, if you think about what happened on, I think it was December 31st of 2020, when the 10 living defense secretaries wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post saying to the, to the military, don't think about it, do not get involved, this is not okay. It was clearly on people's minds. If that had happened, we would not be today where we are now. And I think what happened is in both cases, they missed the tick. So I don't think that a civil war is something that happens deliberately. And I think now we are on guard to make sure it cannot happen precipitously. We have also heard from a number of retired military leaders about warnings concerning what Donald Trump tried to do then and what he may try to do if he were to get back into office. And he, the president is commander in chief. So at what point, and there are a lot of concerns being expressed in, in some of our questions, uh, where does the military come down in this? Could it be uh, enlisted legally to do illegal things? And, and where could the leadership in the military draw a line that would put themselves maybe in jeopardy of not obeying orders, but of following what they think is a constitutional course? Well, I am not a military uh, lawyer. But I will say that the military has its own very strong historical background and very strong military code. And, and um, Trump broke that repeatedly and got a lot of pushback for, for breaking it. And 
that, you know, the, the leadership of the military, it seems to me, has a lot of guardrails around it. There are concerns about the rank and file of the military, and yet people do tend to forget that more than 40% of our military is people of color um, who tend not to back Donald Trump. So it's not, I, I think sometimes we see images of the military as being really problematic, and I'm sure there are people who are problematic in it, but it is absolutely not monolithic. So that's out there first, but second is the question of, do they have to do what the commander in chief says? And one of the things that you saw from from Mark Milley, one of the things, uh, former Joint Chiefs, Chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, one of the things that you saw from other leaders was continuing to repeat to the people around them that the military has an obligation not to obey an illegal order. Now, like under the Insurrection Act, it's a little unclear. I, you know, what would you have done? And I don't mean you necessarily, but when you think about this rhetorically, if, God forbid, the, the January 6th insurrectionists had gotten their hands on one of our leaders, on, on, the, on the former vice president and the, the, or the, the Speaker of the House, and the president had said, oh my God, the insurrectionists have taken over the Capitol and they've, 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 they've taken, I'm not going to go there, but ha have control over one of our elected leaders. I've called out the troops in that moment would we have known what to do? And that's that's something I think to be concerned about because sh shifting loyalties in a moment like that, you have to guess that you're jumping the right way. But I, I have a lot of faith in today's military in part because they have so many guardrails around them, like the Posse Comitatus Act, which only applies legally to the military, which says you can't use the military against the American people, except in case of insurrection. The other branches of the military have all adopted the Posse Comitatus Act voluntarily, even though they're not covered by it. The one that has not, and the one that is still sort of, I think, um, too new to have any traditions of its own, are all the troops that the president himself commands under the Homeland under Homeland Security. And those are the people who turned out to support him in, um, in the summer of 2020. The ones who had their badges turned around on the on the steps of the Washington of the Lincoln Memorial. Those I think are deeply problematic. And there's a lot more of them than people are aware of. And those I think that's one of the things I would like to see going forward is that we put more guard rails around the law enforcement officers who are associated with Homeland Security. And yet it seems that the, the Trump faction uh, in kind of an American tradition of rejecting the elite or the intellectuals um, is not paying attention even to the leadership, like the military leadership or former presidents of any political stripe or former diplomats, secretaries of state that that they're the, they're the elite, they're the deep state, we're not going to bother with them anymore. How do you get through to that 30% or can you go ahead and just win an election and govern without that 30%, that unregenerate 30%? I think they're gone. Personally, I think they're gone. That, that you know, it, it would be lovely to say that we can build bridges. And, and some of them you can, certainly. You read about people who have been MAGA Republicans and who have recognized that they were sold a bill of goods. But elections are decided not by the fringes, they're decided by the middle. And that's where you work to expand um, a coalition to defend democracy. And there are plenty of people with R's by their names who don't like the MAGA Republicans. They come up to me all the time and they say, I don't have a party, what am I going to do? And my answer is always, you know, get rid of that side and rebuild your party because right now it's either democracy or bust, right? So, um, so to, you know, when people always say to me, how do I get those people back? And I'm like, it's not a good use of your time. They're, they're not, it's not going to happen. And for what it's worth, my, my template on that is the, is reconstruction. You know, the, the number of people who were unwilling to accept the new conditions of the United States after the Civil War was very small, but they were extraordinarily bitter. And interestingly enough, they happened, they usually looked like people who had not actually been on the battlefield. These are women's diaries, for example, or people who had stayed back home. The soldiers themselves were like, you know, it ain't looking so bad over there. They got homesteads, they got railroads, they got paychecks, they got newspapers, they got they got they got theater you can go to. I don't want, I'd like to do that. 
But the, the president at the time, Andrew Johnson, after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, really encouraged that reactionary right. And then increasingly, the, the, the governments in the states, but also at the federal level, the federal level looked the other way. And in the states, they encouraged that reactionary very small minority so they could take over the the states which you know really suffered under one party rule from about you know 1874 through 1965 so you know i think the trick is to make sure not to obey in advance not to let the government support that and and extend the the rule of that reactionary right and to recognize that you are never going to win everybody you just have to win a majority so then given that, what does this campaign look like? You have Trump who may be speaking to his 30% and Biden speaking to the other 70%? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, but I don't think it's just Biden. I mean, Biden's a really interesting character and we could talk about him. But again, what, what interests me in this moment is the degree to which people who didn't think that any of this mattered because they really believed the liberal consensus was going to stay in place. So for example, you hear all the time, Oh, they're never going to come for Social Security. They're never going to come for medical Medicare. They're Even never going to come for Roe versus Wade. Well, that's what I was going to say. Oh, Even sorry. though they've been saying this all along, but when they came for Roe versus Wade, and now you're watching the fallout from that, I think a lot of people who did not think politics mattered to them are getting involved. And so, so it's partly about the Biden administration and the the Biden campaign. But I think it's more about us saying, you know, this is not what we want. And and I'm a, I have become, I was not an initial Biden supporter. I've become a big Biden supporter. But there's a whole new world out there in in if we protect democracy, and it's going to be a very different world in 2028. And we get to decide what we want that world to look like if only we are willing to step up and take control of it. Your portfolio is mostly American history, but before we started this program, we spoke briefly about the consequences of another Trump presidency to America's role in the world, because for almost 100 years, we have enjoyed a position of pretty much being the indispensable nation. Um, we have seen that in how we dealt with World War I, and of course, particularly World War II, the reshaping of the political globe after that. Um, the, the consequences at home would be profound. You could see already the abandonment of Ukraine, a different approach to Israel and what's going on with Israel and Gaza right now. Um, and Donald Trump was just quoted as, by some senior European diplomat as, as saying that, you know, that with him, NATO is over. We will not come to your aid if there's any kind of a war. So we know what that America would look like. Uh, is, is this anything that even registers or on the radar of American voters, or or do they care? Are we back to isolationism from 1940 again? So this is this is actually I am an Americanist, and it's funny because be, being an Americanist, we have a, a relatively short history, so you can do an awful lot of it. And I was extraordinarily good at American foreign policy up through World War II when I started writing letters from an American, but I just didn't want to deal with the United States after that because it gets so complicated so fast, right? So I was, I was like, I don't really do that stuff. Well, you can't do the, the, the globe after um, February of, of 2022 when Vladimir Putin reinvaded Ukraine without doing foreign foreign policy. So basically that in my free time, that's what I do. I, I read foreign policy, I study foreign policy, and I'm I am now fascinated by it. And I am I'm also fascinated by how little of it there is in the American media. Because until really until Korea and maybe even beyond that, um foreign policy and domestic policy were seen as both sides of the same coin. And really until the National Security Act of 1947, Americans were really involved in foreign policy and they were supposed to be involved in foreign policy. So th this moment is incredibly important in the relationship of the United States to the world. So what you've just identified is correct. If you remember the first place that Former President Trump went when he went abroad as a president was to Saudi Arabia. And he said at the time is a quote in which he somebody said, well, you know, there's a little problem of, of you know, the fact that they've just recently chopped up a, a, a reporter 
um, and, and what are you doing here? And he said, ah, you know, you think we're so great. You know, this is about transactions and we are going to be a transactional nation. He was going to get rid of all of our alliances and he was going to make business deals essentially with other countries. And he said he would pull out of NATO and he said he, would, and he did pull out of the, the climate accords. He did pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He did pull out of the World Health Organization. And what those things are is they are the institutions that were set up after World War II to create a rules-based international order. And what that meant was that rather than, than big countries swallowing up little countries and going to war and get, gathering territory, instead we would have an overlapping system of organizations that would enable there to be buffers and discussions of problems before they blew up into wars. So, so people, you know, when you talk about the rules-based international order, people sit there and say, oh, well, we've always broken that. And the answer to that is, well, a lot of places have broken that. But if you lose that altogether, that's like saying we shouldn't have laws in the United States because people still rob banks. You know, you need the rules there in place because otherwise the bank robbers do every take over everything, right? So Trump was going to pull us out of all those things. And one of the things that he did by saying he was going to pull out of NATO is really to put the put real fear into a number of our allies. And you're seeing them now, for example, in the EU, for example, uh, working to build their own defense systems because they no longer trust that the United States is going to be there. Biden has done amazing stuff, but what happens if Trump is reelected? So one of the things that that's done is it's really pushed the United States sort of back on its heels with them saying, listen, guys, it's been great, but now we're, we're not, we don't think you're a very reliable partner, which is one of the reasons the fact that the House Republicans are refusing to put money behind either Israel or Ukraine right now is a real problem. And aside from anything else, it basically says the Americans can't be trusted. So what does that mean going forward for American foreign policy? And this, I think, is absolutely fascinating. So if you think about what the Biden administration has done, it has this really crappy name for what it's done. It, it's actually the, the term that they are using, and it, it has a long history, but the, the term they're using is called diplomatic variable geometry, to which I'm like, could you put more syllables in three words, really? But what, they, what it really means is that rather than sort of being superpowers and dividing the world among superpowers or great powers where you got big places that are have these satellites around them and they struggle with each other through their satellites, what the Biden administration is trying to do and has done extraordinarily successfully in, in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific and in, in to some degree successfully, but probably less so so far in Latin America and now in the Middle East, is to try to create what are sort of ad hoc committees of countries that are involved in a certain problem. So to, not saying that we all have to be democracies or we all have to be people who believe in this or people who believe in that, but we have a problem with immigration in Latin America. The United States is a problem because we don't want all these people coming uh, periodically over the border, but your countries have a part problem when, for example, Venezuela has lost 20% of its population over the course of the last decade or so. You, We have a problem as a group and we have to solve it as a group. So rather than having everything come down to the border of the southern border of the United States, instead we're going to have new rules where states uh, have to, you have to apply an asylum in the states through which you come before you get to the United States. And we're gonna have places in those countries where you can apply for asylum from them rather than crossing, making this incredibly dangerous crossing. And we're gonna have rules in place so that people are treated fairly and that they're treated humanely. And there was actually a major declaration coming out of Los Angeles early, early on in the, in the Biden administration to do that. But the way that Biden has put together, for example, and it really has been Biden and Blinken, have put together uh, the, the countries in the Indo-Pacific, not just to, to be a counter to China, which is what you keep reading in a number of the, the places that deal with it, but rather to bolster those countries so that they, they have some give and take, that they don't have to just do what China says or what the US does, or the degree to which the United States has really encouraged the participation of the African Union in the, the G20. Now, I, I don't know if they're gonna start calling it the G20, 21, but Africa has a seat now at the G20 because of the Biden administration. And similarly, in the middle in the Middle East, we hear all the time about America and Israel and Hamas. But in fact, Blinken and Biden have both 
been circling through the Arab countries again and again and again to try and make sure that there is some kind of peace established there. And it's important to remember that the people who are attacking Israel right now are non-state actors. They're not the states any longer. They're right. non-state actors. Let, so, I'm, I, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. We've got a lot of questions from our, our, our viewers. They're very smart. So uh, we'd like to do, if we could, a lightning round to get to some of those yeah. with uh, with questions and answers that, that they're looking for. I'm so sorry to have interrupted you. Um, let's see, Courtney says, I'm a teacher of high school students. This goes to some of the lessons at the back of your book. Courtney says, I'm a teacher of high school students. How do I best simplify and describe this political moment in time to our very near future voters? So honestly, I really like the Declaration of Independence because in it, just there in the preamble, it says two things. It, it, of course, they're only talking about men, and you can talk about how that has to be expanded and how it has been expanded ever since. But it promises two things. It promises that we'll be treated equally before the law, we're all created equal, and it promises that we have a right to a say in our government, that the, you know, the, the legitimacy of a government is derived from the consent, consent of the people who, who make up that government. And that's, that seems to me to be a yardstick from which everything else flows. So that, I think, is probably a pretty good place to start. Um, we have several people who have asked about the Supreme Court and whether the sense that it's been co-opted, that its allegiance is, as one Trump advisor implied, should be to Donald Trump and to his interests. And in the larger sense, we have the uh, the, the corruption, the, the money, the gifts that flowed to Clarence Thomas and what obligations that seemed to create for him. So the question is about confidence that the Supreme Court can is committed to and can maintain democratic institutions in its role. I think John Roberts is concerned about where the court is going right now, the Chief Justice, but I think that there is indeed a major crisis in the Supreme Court and that it 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 is going to have a very hard time maintaining its legitimacy. And as a result, to some degree, it has backed off a little bit in some of the places in which it was most extreme. But one of the things that I would say is that this idea that you have to be carried out toes up from the Supreme Court is very, very new. Um, and the one of the things that I think we should be doing is keeping real pressure on Clarence Thomas, who is compromised beyond belief, and also on Samuel Alito, who is also compromised, and recognize that at the end of the day, the Supreme Court's only power is whether or not we think they are uh, they are legitimate and whether or not we agree with their decisions. And that's something the American people should have something to say about. This is not Where the first corrupt uh, Supreme Court we've had, by the way. And, um, and basically what happened is people started ignoring them and the next Supreme Court cleaned it up. So where would that pressure come from that would that Alito or Thomas would put, pay any attention to? Well, public pressure, that is uh, speaking up, newspapers, social media saying this is not okay. And, and actually they have responded uh, that if you think about the fact that, uh, that Thomas recently recused himself from a January 6th case, which he never had before. He would not have done that before. But, but simply taking, as I would say to people, take up oxygen. That's what gets people to change their behavior. Uh, there's a, also a question following on your description of what might happen under the 12th Amendment. What else might happen if Trump were to lose the election, not just in the institutions of democracy, but outside, in, outside those buildings, outside those, uh, those halls? Well, I think we have to assume, and I mean, I'm not, this is no secret. I, I think he's trying to build a group of people who are loyal enough to him to create violence in the streets. And I think we're not going to wait until after the election for that. I think we're going to see that sooner rather than later. I think if you listen to the way he's talking, you think about the people he is trying to rile up. He is encouraging people to get in the streets and intimidate the rest of us so that we will stand down if, in fact, he manages to steal the election. So what do I expect to happen? I, I actually am I'm concerned about, about the, the next several months. I'm, I'm concerned right through the next year because no matter what happens in November of 2024, the end result uh, will not be peaceful. If Trump is reelected, his people will be in the streets and they, they will not be peaceful. And if Biden is elect reelected, the same will happen again. What, I'm sorry not to be more cheerful about that. No, and I understand. I we'll, a, in, a, I we'll, in a couple of minutes, I'll get to the, the the cheerful bit. But but people would also like your sense of what um, 
what's going on with Trump facing so many prosecutions, civil and criminal, the idea that he's been removed from a couple of ballots, which of course awaits a, a higher court judgment on whether that can happen, his viability as a candidate. You have in Biden and Trump people who some folks will be voting against rather than for. Uh, and, and in consequence, then, how damaged a candidate is he for that particular swing sex segment, that middle that may be making up its minds now? So a couple of things about that. First of all, don't worry about the polls. Um, even if you like polls, don't worry about them now because any pollster will tell you that during the the Republican during when when only one side is having a primary, that always polls higher than anybody else because they're hearing the, those names. People who are or being polled hear those names more often. But this is actually really interesting because I am of the opinion that the cases that Trump is facing is are going to hurt him very badly if they come to pass. I mean, this is one of the things that we're arguing about right now, right? In the in, in uh, uh, Jack Smith's January 6th case is whether or not the Supreme Court is gonna slow that down enough that we don't get an answer until after the election. I actually don't think that's gonna happen, but I hate to have made that prediction because I'm always wrong about this stuff. But if in fact he actually is, 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 is convicted in a public way. So we have hearings, we have trials, we have the news coming out. That's going to hurt him a lot because as I say, the, the, the true Trump believers, nothing's going to change their minds. Absolutely nothing. And I don't think by the way that those voters are transferable to somebody else. They're not going to turn out for Nikki Haley or anybody else. It's Trump or bust. But, um, but the people that Trump needs to win the election fairly are people who look at that and they're like, Aside from anything else, I'm just tired of the chaos. So I think it's actually a real problem for him, which I think speaks to the fact he's not even trying to get anybody to vote for him at this point. He is doubling down on the extremists and on the authoritarian language. So, um, so what does that look like for the campaign? I think that that anything can happen in the next several months. I think probably even maybe bigger, but maybe as big as that, is that most people haven't seen Trump really since 2016. He was kept pretty under wraps during his presidency. And now, of course, he's not showing up for any of the hearings, I mean, any of the of the debates. Um, and people haven't really seen him. And he has deteriorated significantly. How and do you I, mean deteriorated? He can't put a sentence together. He, I mean, love him or hate him, he used to be able to really hold a crowd. He can't hold a crowd anymore. He is angry. He is always talking about being victimized. It's not, it's not a, a thing that's going to pick up any extra voters, which is why I'm real concerned about, about, as you say, the mechanics of democracy. They're not looking to me like a group of people who want to win an election. They're looking to me like a group of people who want to steal an election. And can you speak, as someone has asked about the the third party candidates in the case of Michigan in 2016, the presence of Jill Stein may have thrown it to Trump instead of Hillary Clinton. You've got RFK Jr. is trying to get on the ballot. Third party risks, third party dangers to Trump, to Biden. Well, and the no labels. Uh, the Again, one of the problems with third parties is that they could deprive either of the candidates of a majority. Um, another one is, of course, that they could split the vote in the Electoral College, or they could split the vote. Um, I think that uh, that there are third, real third parties are important in the United States in our history because they introduce a number of topics that aren't being covered elsewhere. So the populists, for example, in the late 19th century were hugely important because they called attention to a lot of issues that the two major parties weren't paying attention to. And within about 10 years, one of the major parties, the Democrats, had adopted uh, virtually everything they wanted and the Republicans got on board as well. In the cases of everything that you're talking about, these are spoilers. And these are spoilers whose own histories are checkered enough that it is um, not a stretch to think that they are deliberate spoilers in this race. And, and I, I would say this is voting for any of them in this, in, this, in this cycle is voting against democracy. I'm not sure how much longer they'll all hold on or how many people they will ultimately pick up uh, going forward. Again, we're still fairly early days in this election. We have a minute for you now on top of this grim cake to give us some sweet frosting, something to maybe positive to look forward to. Well, so let's go back to what I was saying before about this moment. And that's that people always say to me, why are you so 
cheerful about things. And cheerful is the wrong word because I'm not cheerful. I'm very worried about a lot of things. But I always say I am more hopeful now than I was in 2014. And the reason for that is because the road to where we are now was very clear way back in the Reagan administration. You know, and for me, when George W. Bush put the signing statement on the torture memo, on the torture, uh, on the torture law that the, the, the Congress had said, there will be no more, this is after the waterboarding scandal, there will be no more torture associated with the United States. And George W. Bush put a signing statement on that saying, I'm gonna do whatever I think I need to do to keep the country safe, including torture. And nobody really reacted. I mean, some people did, but it just would, it wasn't even a blip. I thought, uh-oh, we are in real trouble. That would never happen nowadays because Americans are paying attention. And in the United States in the 1850s and, and even the, the 1770s and the 1850s and the 1890s and the 1930s and the 1960s and with luck now, when Americans began to pay attention to what was happening in their democracy and recognize that we were about to be taken over either by an oligarchy or now by an authoritarian, they got together and they said, listen, we might not agree on anything. Wait. except that we don't want that. And when we have done that, we have always managed to take the country back. And we have, at the end of that crisis, expanded liberal democracy and created a more just and a fairer society. So I know we are, we're interrupting you at, at crucial moments. And this all this means is that I hope that you'll be able to come back because your analysis is so valuable and useful and your optimism, if I can call it that, is inspiring to a lot of us. So I thank you very much, Heather Cox Richardson's book, Democracy Awakening Notes on the State of America. Thank you so very much. Next week, next Wednesday, Erwin Chemerinsky, the head of the law school at UC Berkeley, here to talk. And of course, he's always worth listening to and then some. I'm Pat Morrison. Thank you for joining us.